Hello, hello everyone. I'm going to give it just a minute or so for every attendee to join us. Please be patient. All right, hello, good people. My name is Robert Stuckey, the Irrigation Association's Education Manager. And I'm pleased to welcome you to our second Manufacturer Series webinar of 2023. Today's webinar titled, Making Smarter Decisions with Two Wire, is sponsored by Hunter Industries. Founded in 1981, Hunter Industries is a family-owned manufacturer of best-in-class solutions for landscape irrigation, outdoor lighting, dispensing technology, and custom manufacturing sectors. To learn more about these innovative technologies, please visit their website at corporate.hunterindustries.com. Before we start the presentation, I'd like everyone to know that this session is being recorded and that all attendee microphones will be muted. This particular webinar is worth one CEU. By navigating to the certification tab on the IA's website and locating the submit CEUs option, you can easily record your credit score. For those that are unfamiliar with our web address, it is irrigation.org. If you have any questions, please type them into the chat box. Our presenter will do his best to answer them closer to the end of the presentation. Our speaker today is Greg, Greg Rosing. At Hunter, Greg's ex expertise lies in the technical aspects of designing, installing, and troubleshooting irrigation and landscape lighting systems. He works with the landscape and irrigation designers to help them understand and design using Hunter's line of products. Greg's, Greg's commitment to professional development is evident through his educational background, including a degree from San Diego State University. He also holds an array of industry certifications, including our very own CID, CLIA, CIT, as well as the LICT, QUEL, CLVLT, and RWSS. These certifications are evidence of Greg's dedication to staying at the forefront of industry trends and best practices. With a blend of technology proficiency, a wealth of experience, and a genuine passion for helping others succeed, Greg is passionate about his role in the green industry. Without further ado, I'd like to give our valued member of the IA Education Committee the floor. Take it away, Greg. Hey, thank you very much, Robert. I really appreciate the generous intro. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with who I am, some of you guys may know me, some of you I will get to know a little bit today. Um, we're going to be talking about making smart decisions with Two Wire, but my name is Greg Rosink, and as you mentioned, I am the Southern California Specification Manager at Hunter Industries, but I did just get off of six years as the National um, Training Manager. So Coming from that side of the business and going into the specification side of the market has helped me better understand how two wire can serve a lot more purposes. And, and uh, I think that one of the things with two wire that we, you know, commonly hear in the industry is, Hey, it's, it's hard to use. It's complicated. The technicians, you know, aren't a huge fan of it, things like that. What I want to do today is demystify all of these things that are floating around the two wire conversation and talk about when and where two wire can be applicable for you guys. So here's my contact information so that if after the uh, webinar, you're interested in reaching out to me about anything else, feel free to. That's greg.rosink at hunterindustries.com. And I want to point out a couple of websites real quick. That's hunterindustries.com and training.hunterindustries.com. Hunterindustries.com, we have a million different support articles for our products. Uh, so if you did want to get to know a little bit more about Two Wire, feel free to visit and see what controllers we have available to you. I will also be showing a kind of a comparison chart of our Two Wire offering. Uh, Robert has been so kind to add that into the chat. So you guys can download the documents that I'm talking about. There's three of them. And uh, throughout the presentation, you can download them and reference them as I'm discussing them, uh, or you can just hold on to them for future use. So I wanted to give that to you guys as a little bit of a takeaway. 
but feel free to visit hunterindustries.com. Also training at hunterindustries.com is Hunter University. I'm wrapping it on the shirt right here. That was my world for the last six years and I love it with all of my heart. So we've put together a bunch of trainings, uh, videos, training modules, um, quizzes and things like that to help our industry partners, our customers, our distributors, our specifiers and designers to give them tools to be more successful with our products. So all of that stuff is free online and I highly encourage you to check it out. There's a little bit of something for everyone. And for some people, there's a lot more than, you know, just a couple of things. So go check that out, please. Uh, so for today, our discussion topics, we're going to talk about two wire versus conventional. So I want to explain that a little bit for those of you that may not understand what a two wire system is, or even a conventional system, this might all be new to you guys. I also want to talk about when to choose two wire versus conventional. This is a common question I get. Hey, I'm doing a project. Do you think I should use two wire on it? Or should I just stick with a conventional system? I'm going to give you guys some tips on when to use two wire systems versus conventional systems. Um, we got to look at what our desire for control is. What level of control do we want over the system? We're going to look at smart sensors and communication. And we're going to talk about des best design practices as well as installation best practices. And also for all of you that have registered, I, I do need to address the elephant in the room. Kevin was co-presenting with me today, but something came up last minute and he's very sorry that he couldn't be here. So anybody that came to see Kevin Battistoni and uh, hear his, you know, comical uh, presentations, it's, I, I'm sorry. And I apologize for that, but uh, you'll just get me today. So anyways, let's move on. So let's do a little overview of what a two wire system is versus a conventional system. Let's talk first about conventionally wired systems. So a conventionally wired system has a control or station wire that goes to every single valve solenoid in the field. Then there's a common wire that daisy chains between all of them and is common to all valves. So we call that the common wire. Uh, so we have the control wire or station wire, which is the red wires in this case. And then we have the common wire, which is the black wire in this case. Commonly, the common wire is white. So in most irrigation systems conventionally wired, you're gonna have a white common wire. And the station wire might be black, it might be red, it might be blue. But you'll see a lot more of the station wires versus the common wire is what I'm getting at. So with a conventionally, uh, conventionally wired system, you have 120 volts AC current coming in from your power grid. There's a transformer in the controller that converts that to low voltage, which is 24 to 26 volts of energy at 60 hertz that's being sent down the wire path to activate the solenoids in the field. So when a station needs to activate, it powers up the station one terminal and the common, creates a link and activates the solenoid on that. If you wanted to connect to three and turn on station three, it would uh, power up the station three terminal on the clock and the common, and that would create a 24 volt circuit. So what's different when we, oh, and let me show you this picture. So this is 99 station wires with, I believe, nine common wires. That's a big bundle of wires. If you can imagine 14 gauge or 12 gauge is a very thick wire. When you get 99 of those together, that is a huge bundle of wires. Now, if anything happens, if that gets compromised in any way, whether it be a backhoe cutting through the wires or maybe even just um, someone cutting a line into a, a yard or something. If you cut that wire, it's very complicated to fix it. And it's very time consuming. So let's look at what a two wire system and a two wire setup looks like. First, let's, let's look at what a conventional wired solenoid looks like in the valve box. So here's a conventionally wired valve box. You've got your solenoid here with the two red wires coming off. And they're gonna connect to a red wire, which would be your station wire in this case. And the other wire would connect to the common wire, which would be common to all valves, and in this case is white. You'll see that we have waterproof wire connectors. I will point out that somebody missed the bar on installing these waterproof connectors because these wire nuts should be pushed all the way to the very bottom of the waterproof gel-filled tubing. So that is something that is going to be absolutely necessary when you're doing a two-wire system because there's more area for compromise. Sometimes you'll see a spare wire that a designer has put in the box. 
to make sure that you have a backup plan for a wire that gets nicked, cut, or damaged along the you know, life of the system. And sometimes we can use that spare wire to reconnect the valve so we don't have a bunch of battery operated valves all over the place. Or uh, some people try to do it to prevent costly wire tracing and repair. Okay, so a two wire decoder system has a set of two wires, in our case, red and blue, that go all the way through the system from the controller. Off of that two wire path, you have a decoder. That's these little black boxes. Now the decoder is like your phone in a telephone system. I know we don't really have your home phone landlines anymore, but it works the same as kind of a cell phone. The cell tower sends out a signal. Your phone has a unique phone number, just like the decoder has a unique identification number. And inside of that, it deciphers the code as something's being sent along. So in this case, you'll see a, a series of one station decoders and then this two station decoder right here. The wires coming off are slightly different, so you can identify which one's station one or port one and which one's port two. Okay, so this is a little bit different on our ACC system. It's got 124 volts coming in, or 124 volts coming, yeah, 120 volts coming in or 240 volts. And then it's putting out a 30 to 35 volt AC DC um, communication. This gives us a distance to go very far distances to travel very far away from the controller with the decoders. So valves can be very far away. You'll see an example of our two wire here. So this is the twisted two wire pair, and this is the protective jacketing that goes around the outside to protect not only the wire, but to keep it out of, if it's above ground for any amount of time to keep the UV damage off of the wires within. So for reference, I put the jacketing on the image on the left. So you can see non-jacketed and jacketed wire. So two-wire decoder technology from Hunter gives us the opportunity to run up to 225 valves over a single pair of wires for miles. So we can go up to almost three miles away from the controller on the farthest valve in the system. Now, the way that it works is it sends that signal down the two-wire path. And here we have six decoders in place. If we wanted to turn station five on, the controller is going to send the communication down the wire path. And then the decoder that's programmed to station five knows that it's supposed to turn on. So we energize it. We send the communication. And yes, I say communication down the wire path. And that decoder knows to turn on because it knows it's programmed to station five. And it allows the energy to pass from the two wire path, convert it to what the solenoid needs to activate and turn on the valve. Now, the power of the solenoids and the digital signal communication are both sent over the two-wire path. So what's different about two-wire versus conventional is we have communication going down. So now we're not just talking about voltage, we're talking about communication wire. And that's why it's so important to have sound connections and clean wire without nicks and scrapes and things like that in the ground. So, Here's some reasons we might think about using two wire over conventional on a project. So is the project going to be phased? Projects like master plan communities, schools, municipality complexes, um, cityscapes, things like that, where we're going to put in a, a phase of the project. We're going to put in maybe building number one with some landscape around it. But we know that in two years, we're going to be done building building number two. So we need to be able to extend the stations off of that without having a huge bundle of wires pulled up in the ground, ready to make a bunch of wire connections and continue on in the, in the wire path. So with the two wire system, we can just take the set of two wires that ended after phase one, connect more wire to those two wires and continue it on in the system for the next phase of the project. This makes life a lot easier. And if there's any construction changes, we can go off of that and we can, make a, we can make a change without it affecting our station counts and the wires that are already in the ground. So will the project have more than a certain amount of stations? For our ACC2, our break-even point around where it is cost-effective to go to two wire is about 30 stations. And then on our easy decoder system, it's about 10 to 15. So about 12 stations is your break-even point where hey, it's actually going to be a cost savings to go to two wire instead of conventional wire, you know, for labor and for copper and things like that. 
Now, is it a lightning prone area? If you're in a highly lightning prone area, like Texas, Florida, especially, um, we can put grounding along the two wire path to minimize the amount of damage that happens when a lightning strike occurs. So this is a good um, solution for lightning prone areas. Now, how far will the valves be away from the controller? If we're using an advanced two wire system like the ACC2, we can have wire or we can have decoders be up to 10,000 feet with 14 gauge wire and up to 15,000 feet on 12 gauge wire from the controller. That's just less than two to almost up to three miles. Will there be multiple water sources or POCs? If you need multiple points of connection, multiple master valves and multiple flow sensors, that might be an option for selecting. If those points of connection are spread out on the property, this is going to be two wires going to be a really good solution for that project specifically. Now, we got other things like water supplies from cisterns, switch to water harvesting systems, multi-level projects, podium, green roofs. It's a lot easier to get just a set of two wires up to the rooftop of a of a large building to be able to run irrigation and sometimes that's really high up. If you're talking about, you know, Sears Tower, that's 80 stories up, you got to run that wire. If you only have to run two wires, and if there was a change, you need to add a valve, you would just be able to add another decoder to that wire path. So good things to think about in the planning process. Now, pros of two wire, the construction cost savings, greater design flexibility. So we can now go to different parts of the property and add valves if we need to later. Um, less copper wire being consumed. This is not a renewable resource. Copper is what, what copper we have is what we got. So reducing the impact on the environment and the, the, of the amount of copper that we're using in our system is a huge benefit. So just using two wire for the green aspect of, you know, the environment and being positive and sometimes lead design. Um, these are all factors that play into that two wire selection. Um, no spare wires are required. So we don't have to run those spare wires to valve manifolds because we can just add onto this two wire path. The labor cost, man, running a wire from the controller a thousand feet out or 2000 feet out from the controller 16 times takes a long time to do. Doing it 99 times takes even longer. So this is another thing where it's like, hey, if we run the two wire path out from the controller, we only have to do that once. That's a huge labor savings. Then we can add on when we need to. We don't have to have all of these wires in the ground that we have to then come back to, especially on a phase project, and make wire splices in a pull box to continue those wires to that next phase once it's built. That's a lot of labor just doing wire splices. And you're creating a lot of points in the system that could be potential failures in the future when you're doing wire splices and pull boxes all over the property. So construction changes, obviously, if you had to add a valve, remove a valve, uh, change the valve location, it's a lot easier to do with a two-wire path. It allows for future expansion, higher station capacity with fewer controllers. What that means, if you go with a conventional ACC2 controller, you can go up to 54 stations. If you go with a two-wire ACC controller, you can go up to 225 stations. So you can do a lot more stations with one controller meaning if you've got a large property, you can cut down the cost of adding more controllers, which ultimately results in less controllers that need communication costs. So if you have LTE communication and you're paying per controller, if you have fewer controllers, your ongoing charges are going to be a lot less. And then optimizing pump, pump efficiency. This is a huge one. So if you can take a large controller, a large station count controller, and bring the features that ACC2 advanced controllers have, then you can optimize the amount of stations that are running at any given time to optimize the efficiency of the pump. Pumps have an efficiency curve. Where they like to be run at, there's a, a, there's a sweet spot. And if we can run that pump at the sweet spot all night long, it's going to give us the best efficiency for long lasting pump life, as well as energy efficiency and lower cost. So the more stations that we can run at a time, the less amount of time we have to run for increasing our efficiency in irrigation and lowering the cost of running the system. So moving on from there, let's talk about who's going to be, who's going to be maintaining this later. What are some design considerations when we're doing this? 
are we going to have a, are we going to be maintaining it after the install? Is the designer going to hire a, an installer that really knows what they're doing to install the project and maintain it in the future? One of the design considerations is how many valves do we need at the same time? If we're running, if we have a 200 station area, that's going to take a long run cycle. And we need to maximize the amount of time that we have within that watering window. So we need to run multiple stations at a time. If we have a smaller project and we only need to run two stations at a time, then we can look at the, our lower, more cost-effective solution, the easy decoder system. And then should the wire path be installed in conduit? This is an industry debate. Conduit's great because if there's any issues with the wire, it's easy to pull new wire, but sometimes it's hard to troubleshoot wire that's inside of a conduit. So it's a, it's a push and shove on that one. And do I have all the necessary notes and installation details on my plans? If you're the designer, you want to make sure that you have all of the details and notes on your plans to make sure that the contractor that's installing has everything they need to do the job right. So when you're looking at the checklist for your system design, you want to make sure you have the right controller selected, that you're building a complete legend. You include all the specific notes and installation details for that system the two wire path specifications, splice requirements, grounding, and then if there's any documents like as belts and things like that for turnover that you make sure that those are done correctly as well. So let's talk a little bit more about the controller offering and the controller selection. As you saw when you were registering for this event, there's two controller options that we have, the easy decoder and the advanced decoder, the ACC with ICD decoders for two wire selection. Now, how do you choose a decoder controller that's right for your system? A, user interface. You got to know what type of user you're going to have on the site. Is it a small, easy to maintain site? Or is it a large site that's going to take a lot of complicated sensors and things like that, or a lot of smart sensors to make the system run as efficiently as possible? Station capacity. How many stations do you need on that site? If you have 100 stations, you're probably better suited going with an ACC than a ICC2 or an HCC that goes up to 54 stations on decoder. Something to think about. Do you need a standalone onsite ET sensor? Options of web-based control and communication, maintenance, long-range maintenance remotes. Do the maintainers of this system want to be able to access it either from their phone or with a maintenance remote? Um, do you need hybrid operation? Meaning, do you need conventionally wired stations as well as two wire stations on the same controller? Um, and then design and field support factory training. One of the things that you get with any hunter system is great design, field support, and factory training. If you guys have any issues, call your hunter sales rep. They want to make sure that when you're installing the system or designing the system, you're doing it as efficiently as possible so you save money and you don't have to come back to the site to fix anything. So to give you guys a little bit of a cheat sheet here, one of the documents that Robert's going to upload is a kind of a comparison chart for our two wire selection, our two wire offering. So you'll see that we have the uh, Pro-C, the uh, HPC, the ICC2, the HCC, and the ACC2, which are all two wire compatible. I'll let you guys go through that when you're selecting your controllers. It's a great reference sheet to figure out what you need. Uh, and you can cross-reference it to figure out um, which, which is right for your project. So let's talk about the easy decoder system really quick. A simple to use, easier two wire solution, um, which doesn't have two way communication. It's one way communication. So you don't have to worry about the wire path being as sound. So it's a simple low cost two wire for HCC, ICC2, HPC, and Pro C controllers compatible with both HydroWise and Centralis software. So that's both of our online web based platforms. Plug in modules for existing output slots. And what that means is, hey, this is a conventional controller and we're putting a two wire module into it and making a conventional controller two wire. So that gives us the ability to do hybrid control. Now the station counts go up to 54 stations on an HCC and ICC2, and then up to 28 stations technically on an HPC Pro C. It can be up to 32 if you're doing a conventionally and two wire system hybrid. So. It's affordable. We've got HCC. Well, not only is it affordable, but it gives us some options here. HCC and ICC2 have hybrid operation. 
conventional decoder stations up to 54 and HPC and Proce hybrid conventional two wire control up to 32 stations. So this gives us a lot of flexibility. So let's take a look at that real quick. Let's unpack this for, a for just a second. The PCDM is the module that goes inside the Proc and the HPC. Now, if it's just two wire, you can do stations five through 32 on the two wire path without any conventional wires in. This must stay in place. That's a little bit different from the HCC and the ICC too. So know that you can do 28 stations on the two wire path, but we can add in conventional stations to make it a hybrid. So we can do one through four on conventional, and then we can do stations five through 20 or 32 on the two wire path. We can take that up a step and go up to seven stations conventionally, and then do stations eight through 32 on the two wire path. Now, the EZDM is the module that goes into the ICC2 and the HCC, which gives us that two wire capability. Now, the EZDM has two outputs, so you can add two wire paths off of the controller easily so that you can split it up if you needed to go to the west side of the property and to the east side of the property from the controller. Now, we can also do a hybrid combination here. We can go eight stations conventional and then do stations. Um, nine through 54 on the two wire path. We can add station modules in all of the module slots up to 24 stations in the plastic model and then do stations 25 through 54 on the easy DM. Now, what we can do, I'll mention this, I don't have a slide for it, but on the metal enclosure, we have six slots. So you can have up to five conventional modules and then one easy decoder module for the rest of the stations. So if you need to take an existing system, essentially, that's already conventionally wired and you want to add on to it, sometimes the best way to do that is to install an HCC or an ICC2, put in an easy decoder module, and then run the rest of the zones that you need to add on to that site with the two-wire path. And it'll run it just like if it were conventional or just like if it was just two-wire. You're not going to know the difference when you're programming the controller. So just a quick oversight, quick snapshot. PCDM goes to the HPC Proc. EZDM goes over here on the HCC ICC2. Now, for our HPC and our HCC, those controllers are hydrowise capable. So now you have two wire for hydrowise. For the ICC2, it will run off of Centralis. So with a communication method added to it, you can connect it to Centralis. Now that gives you some remote management on almost all of these controllers. So looking at the decoder module side by side, you've got a pump master valve connection. So you can have your pump and master valve on a decoder in the field. You don't have to have it directly wired into the controller, which is a nice add. So if, you're con if your master valve is pretty far away from the controller, you can just add it onto the two wire path. Now, programming an LED, this gives us a lot of insight on what's happening in the system. If it's green, it's on. Uh, when we program, it'll flash to let us know that it indicated it was a successful communication. Um, and then if it turns red, you know that there's a problem, that there's an overload on the, on the path. The two-wire path terminals, the PCDM has one output. The EZDM has two. So ICC and HCC, ProC and HPC. Both of them have a similar programming port that make it easy to program the decoders from the face pack. Now. Easy Decoder only has a single station decoder output module. So only one station decoders on this one. Every valve on the site will have to have a de decoder associated with it. But the red and blue wires are consistent with Hunter's ICD decoder so that our two wire path can be used interchangeably between uh, Easy Decoder and the ACC2 ICD systems. Now it's got an LED light on these decoders, which is awesome. And people have been asking for that for years. So we got you. This lets you know if the station's running. And it's also a good way to do diagnostics. So the black pair of wires that comes off goes straight to the solenoid. So your two wire path coming from the controller connects to red and blue. And the solenoid on the valve connects to the black wires. So this is basically a jumper from the two wire path to the valve that takes the information and turns that valve on and lets you know what's going on. Now. Here's an important message. This, this is going to be where you decide whether you're going to go from 
easy decoder system up to ACC2 based on how far you have to travel from the controller. So your wire guides, here we go. 18 gauge, you can go up to 908 feet. If you go to the pretty much the biggest wire that we typically use in irrigation, which is a 12 gauge wire, gives you a little more surface area so you can get more data down at a farther distance. So you can go up to 3,600 feet with that. And that's distance from the controller. So you can have a wire path that goes 3,600 feet to the west and 3,600 feet to the east. So that doubles your distance. Now we're up to about 7,000 feet from one valve to another along the property. But remember, if you add another solenoid that you're gonna need to run at the same time, if you need to run two stations at a time for your watering window, you're going to cut that distance in half. So anytime there's a second solenoid active, it's going to cut the distance in half based on the consumption from the device. So then why not make something even easier? Easy decoder with the easy DT. This is the diagnostic tool. And what this does is it simplifies our maintenance and troubleshooting. So it's a handheld wireless diagnostic tool for the easy decoder system. It defect, uh, it'll detect faults and perform electrical troubleshooting in the field without uninstalling decoders. So using inductive communication, wireless and electromagnetic induction, it'll communicate through the bottom of the decoder and tell you the health of the decoder um, and, and tell you some more information. I'll, I'll get to that in a sec, but you can program a decoder by flipping up the tab on the top, plugging in the two wires and programming the decoder in the field, or you can do it at your desk. So we're making it even easier for you here. Now, wireless diagnostics. So our proprietary electromagnetic magnetic induction allows us to communicate to that decoder without plugging it into anything. We're just putting the tip of the decoder tool to the bottom of the decoder itself, and we can read decoder status, the station address, voltage, and current draw. So we know if we go to the end of the system and we check our voltage and it's dropped well below 24 volts, we have an issue with um, current loss. So we're getting too far away from the controller or too much consumption is being drawn as if there were two decoders running at the same time. So there's a lot of diagnostics that we can do with that. So think about that when you're selecting the two wire system, what tools make the make the maintenance side of it easier in the, in the diagnostic side. So that being said, traditional two wire decoder system pros, it saves wire and labor time and money back in your pocket by not having the guys having to run wire after wire after wire. It's electrically efficient. So our ACC two system can go up to 15,000 feet, um, operates more stations at a time. So you can do up to 30 stations at a time on the ACC two. So it's, it's electrically efficient, but it's also flexible, easy to expand off of. And there's a lot of sensor capabilities with, with that system. And then on the ACC system, you can put sensors on the two wire path. You can't do that with HCC. So that's a consideration when you're selecting one of the two controller options. Now cons, uh, traditionally cons would be that it requires a perfect installation, but with a little bit of training and a little bit of practice, you're going to get perfect every time you're gonna get better and better at the installation. Now, we say it must be premium grade wire. This is more so for the ACC2 system that we're about to talk about in a minute. The easy decoder system can kind of run off of anything. You saw that it can go down to 18 gauge wire. So you could use an existing multi-strand wire to connect your two wire path to. Now, typically we gotta say it's high spec waterproof connections. Yes, with the with the ACC, we use high spec two wire or uh, water connection, waterproof wire connections. Those connections come with the decoder in the box. So you don't have to go out and buy that. It already comes with it so that you're making sure you put the right water connect, waterproof wire connector on that device. With the easy decoder system, as long as it's a decent waterproof wire connector, we don't really care. You can, you can use whatever you want. You can spec whatever you want. Just make sure it's waterproof. That's always most important. And then we have to do a lot of earth grounding on our larger ACC2 system and our larger advanced systems. Easy decoder, a lot, you know, a lot easier. It's, on, it's in the name. We don't have to ground if we don't need to. If we're in a low, you know, not so lightning prone area, no grounding necessary. If you want to ground in higher lightning prone areas, you can use our surge, our uh, dual surge to add onto the wire path and add some grounding, but it's not necessary. 
requires additional tools for troubleshooting. Well, the great thing is, is we have tools for each system that help you with troubleshooting and maintenance later on. So it may be a con, but we also give you the tool or, you know, you can get the tool to, to use and utilize for that maintenance practice. So we can uh, address any questions you guys have about the easy decoder system at the end here. I'm going to jump into the ACC2 and the advanced decoder controller. So this is where we open up the door for a lot of possibilities. So on our ACC2 system, we have a conventional and a decoder. We're going to be talking about the decoder in this case. So ACC2 75D decoder system. It's got a great user interface, a big screen with a dial and some ATM buttons to make your selection. So it's easy for the guys to understand the field and gives you really good snapshots of the programming that you're putting into the controller. It has modular expansion, starts at 75 stations, goes up to 225 with a third station module or a third decoder module. So this is a cost savings right here. If you're only going to be doing 75 stations, you're saving a a significant amount of cost not installing the other two decoder modules. Now, that's that's a huge deal in itself. You you can select what you need. So we're a little bit more flexible with that. Uh, it's got this reversible face pack, which is awesome. And I'm telling you a few features that are just great for the maintenance side and for the installer side. So that face pack and the previous photo was on the front. You open it up, now it's on the back. It magnetically removes and flips around so that you can see what you're doing while you're programming decoders inside of the clock rather than closing the door, looking at the face pack, opening it back up, putting your stuff in. This is a great way to, to get a snapshot of what's going on inside of the controller while looking at the face pack. Now, when you flip it around, it automatically goes into diagnostic modes for the field techs that are out there looking at the system. Uh, it's got a powerful, high horsepower, three amp transformer, which gives us the ability to activate 30 uh, solenoids simultaneously. So we can have up to 30 stations running at any given moment. Now, hydraulically, you got to make sure that you have the capacity to do that, but we're giving you electrical capacity to do that if it's achievable on your site. So breaking into this, 225 stations with the three expansion modules, base 75 station capacity. Now this is cool, six pump master valves. So we can have up to six master valves and we can have up to six flow sensors. What's a flow sensor without a master valve? So we give you six of each. Now, three click sensors. This is pretty awesome. We can use click sensors on this controller, A, for rain click or you know rain shutdown, soil moisture sensors, but we can also use it with buttons. So we can program if, then, then that features. So if you're doing a project that's a school and you've got a, it all phased out, and one of the areas is going to be the baseball field, and it's really far away from the controller, you can install what we call a coach's button. That coach's button gives that person the ability to just go up, open a little box with their key, push a button, and it'll syringe cycle their entire field right before the game to get it right where they want it before game time. So there are cool if then then that kind of featurealities that we can put into this controller to customize it even further, which you don't get with necessarily with the easy decoder system, but that's because we have this two-way communication within these advanced decoder systems. Now, solar sync on-site sensor, if you need a sensor on site that's reading your weather, like we do in California, they require us to have ET on site to make sure that this controller is making adjustments based off of the weather. We got that option built into the controller. So pretty cool stuff there. Now, stations and programs, we can do up to 32 programs with 10 station times or station start times and 12 hours of runtime on each station. So we've got way more programs than probably anybody's ever going to use, but somebody asked for it. So we gave it to you. Uh, Non-water windows by program. So we can do non-water windows at the program level so that we can say, hey, overhead turf zones cannot water between this time and this time. So that's a water window. Outside of that, it's not allowed to turn on. So we can do that for the turf zones. But if there's no regulations on drip zones in the shrub areas, by all means, let it run all day long if that's what you can do to you know maximize your watering uh, schedule. So per program is very helpful for having some custom customizability on these programming scenarios. So then visual program summary. This gives you a snapshot of where the watering schedule is at based on what you've put into the controller. 
And if you have a watering restriction or a no water window on that program, it's going to show you when that starts to make sure that your program isn't overlapping into the watering restriction area. If it does, you want to adjust the programming so that it doesn't fall into that restriction. But you'll see that program five has no restriction and it's watering over the time that program four, program two, and program one have. So we can schedule multiple stations at a desired flow rate with flow management. So flow management and flow monitoring are buzzwords that are kind of flying around the market right now. Flow management, to break it down, basically allows you to set a target based on your mainline size. So if you have a two inch mainline, your flow target's gonna be about 50 gallons per minute. Now, what that means is it's going to find and source stations based on their flow rates to run effectively at the same time where it doesn't exceed that flow target. Now, if you said our flow target was 50 gallons per minute, it would run five 10 gallon per minute stations. And if one ended before the rest of them, that would shut off. And then it would go search around for another five to 10 gallon per minute zone to run at the same time. This is huge if you're running pumps on a site because it maximizes that efficiency and reduces the runtime overall. So it reduces the amount of electrical consumption that's happening on site. So really, really great stuff there. Um, a lot of customizability. Now flow monitoring just gives you the ability to oversee what's happening on the site. When something's running, it tells you how many gallons per minute are running. Now that's a huge benefit for anybody who wants to know if there's a leak in the system, because if there's water running, but nothing's on, we got a leak. If a station you know, is supposed to be running at two gallons per minute, and all of a sudden it's running at 10 gallons per minute, we can get an alert saying that, hey, something's wrong with that station. Let's take a look at that. And then you can send a service tech out to take a look at it. So that is some high level uh, flow monitoring and flow management opportunities that you can do with a more advanced system. Now we have central control. We can do our Centralis platform on the ACC2 and ICC2, which gives you a snapshot of where your controllers are located. So this is great for parks and municipalities and things like that that have controllers all over the city where you need to see their location. And then you can dial down into each particular controller and you can see station programming. You can manage uh, your, your seasonal adjustment. You can see sensors, you can see flows. And when I say that, you can see a snapshot of actual flow happening on each project in gallons or liters per minute. The flow totals are by day, by week, by month, and by year. So you can actually see how much water ran on a specific day of the year or in a specific month of the year. You've got selectable date ranges, so you can get a report of how much flow happened between you know, January and March. And it gives you um, that in gallons per minute or cubic liters. Um, and then totals by sensor. So you can see per sensor up to those six sensors that are available, how much flow has happened on each sensor. So you can break it down by day, month, year, week, and by sensor within the system. So for some people in the water management side, that's a huge benefit to know exactly how much water is being used on the property. Now, for those that are out there doing the maintenance side of it, it's great to have a remote in your pocket. You got a smartphone, pull it out, log into your account. You've got an instant remote out in the field, which doesn't depend on line of sight. So instead of a maintenance remote that has line of sight, you've got your cell and you can just connect right into it and start stations. So for communication, on the ACC2 and ICC2, we can communicate via Wi-Fi, LAN, and L LTE, so cellular. Now, on the HCC and the HPC, we are restricted to just Wi-Fi. So that is a Wi-Fi communication. So if you're going to need LAN or LTE cell, I would go with an ICC2 or an ACC2. Now, decoders. So this is... A decoder, like we talked about, is the decipher method that takes the information from the controller and turns on the valve. We have a single station for our easy decoder, but we have multiple station decoders for the ACC too. One station, two station, four station, six station, and a flow slash click sensor. So you can read flow off of a decoder. You can also use it as a click sensor for rain or for soil um, or for an in that case that we talked about with the coaches button, you would have one of these sensor decoders there to initiate the communication back to the controller. 
Uh, surge protection is built in. You'll see the copper wire coming off of each one of our ICD decoders. So you can pretty much ground anywhere in the system from that point. Uh, has the two-way communication and you can have up to two hunter solenoids per output. Some people request this, but typically you're just gonna have one solenoid per decoder output. So that would be on a single station, just this set of black wires. On a two station decoder on the ICD 200, you would have one uh, solenoid on the pair of black wires and you have one solenoid on the pair of yellow wires, but you could do two on each if you wanted to. All right, so some of the two wire path things that I wanna talk about on the design side and installation side. It's the backbone of your system. So you wanna make sure that it's installed right and use the right wire connectors. It's equally as important as your main line. It's, commu it's sending all your communication to and from the field. And it's your sensor communication. So if you have a flow sensor and you want accurate flow, you need a good pipeline of communication. You need an open highway for that information to get back. Now, do not loop the two wire system. This is what a looped wire path looks like. This makes it very difficult to troubleshoot in the future. And most people will argue that the loop system is required for long distance runs. But if you can go 15,000 feet to the right, to the left, up and down, I don't think you're gonna have any issues with that. So what we recommend is a branched type two wire installation. Having multiple wire paths run out from the controller with different color jacketing so we can identify them for troubleshooting in the future. Makes it a lot easier. So place the decoder at each 24 uh, volt valve and then the max distance from the controller, like I mentioned before with ID one wire is 10,000 feet. Maximum distance with the ID two is 15,000 feet. And then the max distance from decoder to solenoid. So that's if you have the decoder in a valve box and you moved your, um, your station valve away from that area to use a multi-station decoder, you can go up to 150 feet from the decoder to the solenoid on the valve. It's not recommended, but you can. Now, here's an example of using multiple wire paths, and you can do this both on easy decoder and the ICD ACC2 system. Multiple wire paths with different colors helps you identify where the runs go in the system. So I recommend following all splice rules when you wanna tee off on any path. And when I say that you can go 10,000 feet, this wire path can go 10,000 feet to this farthest node right here, or this farthest decoder, and it's 10,000 feet from the controller to this one. So even if you tee off partial way down, you just can't have any wire run more than 10 or 15,000 feet from the controller, depending on what wire you're using. So multiple paths makes it easier for troubleshooting. It distributes the load through multiple decoder lines. That way, if anything happened on the blue wire, if there was an issue with a decoder, it wouldn't bring down the communication to the yellow and the purple wire. Now, the magic's in the wire. So the ID wire, twisted red and blue, direct burial, flexible colored jacket. Uh, the color jacketing is great. It's for correct installation and tracing. So when you're looking back at the system and you're trying to figure out where the issue lies, when you pull that path from the controller, if it's a yellow path or if it's an orange path or a purple path, once you find which one is having the issue, then you know which direction to start looking for with your troubleshooting. So definitely recommended. It's got a high density polyethylene jacket for UV protection during install and for um, you know scratch resistance on the wire so you don't nick the inner wire. It would uh, be your first line of defense to keep that wire nice and clean. So the twisted wire design gives us greater surge resistance, greater tensile strength, and resistance to electrical noise and crosstalk from AC wiring. So twisted wire is common in communication wire. If you look at any wire from a telephone wire to a um, ethernet cable, they'll have twisted wire paths inside commonly to help dissipate any crosstalk from other electrical devices nearby. So here's a, the two product numbers from the uh, partners that we use, Page Irrigation and Regency Wire. You wanted that information. So here's some do's and don'ts for future expansion. So do have jacketed wire 
with waterproof connectors on all the terminations of the wire path. So if you're going to terminate the wire path like this at the end where you're going to expand later, make sure you use waterproof connections on the ends of the wire and put it inside of a valve box. Loop up about six feet of it so you have some expansion uh, to work with and just make your life easier. Don't leave it unconnected with no connectors on the end and don't use non-waterproof connectors. Make sure that's in a box that's dry with waterproof connectors so that when you connect to it, you know you have a really good wire path to work with. Now, it's not the case on HCC and ICC2 with the easy decoder. It's only sending power down the wire path when you activate a station. On the ACC2 advanced decoder systems, it's always sending power down the wire path. So the communication is constantly happening, which can create a vacuum and pull moisture into the wire path if you don't have those good connections. So here's an example of a 210 valve site. This would normally require 542 station conventional controllers, but 210 stations is no problem with an advanced two wire system with a large station count. So it's expandability is endless. So we can put all 210 wires on one wire path and cover the whole project. But why do that when we can create some insurance in our system and have multiple wire paths? So here's an example of splitting that in two. Say the controller's right here by the pool and you go to this half of the property with a purple wire and you go to this half of the property with an orange wire. And what does that do? You can use the full potential of the controller. The entire site won't be without irrigation during diagnostics and repairs. So if one of those wire paths has an issue and it goes down, the other one can still run while you're repairing it or looking for the issues. And it makes it easier to diagnose the problems where they are in the field. Here's an example of a, a maintenance technician out in the field with two different color wires in a box, right? The blue and the orange. Well, when there's a road crossing like this, if he had to figure out where the, you know, if there was an issue over here where stuff wasn't communicating, he could go across the street and have his technician look at what color the wire is on the other side. And he knows that it's either the orange wire that goes to this side or the blue wire. So having that different color identification is huge. And then using multiple wire paths out of the controller, if you can put one wire path on each of the modules, if you're going to have a 225 station count controller, that way it evens the load of, across all three modules. And that way, if there's a big surge or a big issue or a lightning strike that takes out this module, you still have two controller or two modules with two wire paths communicating in the system. Uh, use a different jacket for each one. I already mentioned that, but I don't want to, I don't want to not say it enough. Different color paths make it huge for troubleshooting for any of my troubleshooting technicians out there. Now, if you have a master valve or flow sensor on any of the wire paths, label it inside the controller so you know which one has the, the master valve and flow sensor on it. Makes it easier for troubleshooting that later on as well. And then leave some extra room for expansion, contraction, and uh, just a little bit of strain relief. So you can take this a step further. You can break it up into three areas. You can break it up into six areas. It's up to you. Each decoder output uh, module has three wire path settings or three wire path setups. You can double up in one, but we give you three in each one, which is more than enough. So in this case, you could have two in decoder output module one, two in decoder output module two, and two in decoder output module three. So make sure when you're specifying multiple wire paths that you got the color jacket and that you ask for as-builts when they install this, because that's going to be a huge tool for the maintenance technician in the future. If you're the installer and you're going to be maintaining it as well, double down. It's even better to make really good note of what's going on in the system. Uh, don't put a decoder, um, don't put all decoders on one wire path if you don't have to. Install splice boxes at the base of the controller. That is a bad idea. We see this all the time. They'll have three different wire paths that come from different directions on the property. And then they'll wire them all up in a valve box and then run one wire up to the controller. What a nightmare for troubleshooting. Make sure you run the wire pass all the way back up into the controller. It's going to save the maintenance technician a lot of time. Now, allow wire. Do not allow wire with protect. Do not allow wire without protective jacketing. The two wire twist, it will work, but a lot of times that gets nicked when it's being pulled into the ground. So be careful of that. All right. 
Now, one of the most important parts, the wire splices. Make sure you have sound wire splices and you give yourself extra slack in the box in case the wire gets compromised at the wire splice. That way you can cut back to good clean wire and make a new connection. Our spec is the 3M DBRY-6 and a lot of two wire manufacturers use this same wire protect or wire nut and uh, gel filled tube because it's the best. It is one of the best. It's rated up to 600 volts of electricity. Uh, it's got multiple gauge sizes. It's tapered inside so that you can fit smaller gauge and larger gauge wire. And we recommend that you don't do any more than a three-way splice with these. That's what they're designed for. I've seen it. I don't recommend it. Now, within each connector, you want to use one connector for the red path and one connector for the blue path when you're connecting the decoder to the wire path. So don't try and put them all into one because it won't work well. So each decoder that we sell, no matter what station count it is, has two DBRY-6 connectors in it so that you can connect the decoder to the wire path using that specified connector. So don't worry about it. It's not an added cost. It's already in the decoder box. When you do it, make sure you twist the connector tight. You get it all the way to the bottom of the gel-filled tube. That's the only way to you know, cleanly waterproof this connection. And then we recommend putting it face up or bottom up in the box so moisture doesn't sit on top of it and potentially work its way down into the connector. Now, if you're in really hot climates like Arizona, uh, you know, Florida, where it gets real hot, if you leave them upside down and those valve boxes get real hot, sometimes the, the glue or sorry, not the glue, the gel can start to back out of it. So be careful on that. All right. So here's an example of the connectors that we recommend for downstream when you're on the connector side of the solenoid. So after the decoder to the solenoid, really any good waterproof gel filled wire nut is going to suffice. We recommend the 3M DBOB, but dealer's choice on that one. Just make sure it's the DBRY-6 for the decoder to wire path. All right. Now, let's talk about what a, a decent install looks like. So here's a valve box with a one station decoder. You'll see that the solenoid wires are wired together. Uh, well, you can't really see those, but then you see that our decoder wire path and our decoder wires are connected up with 3M DBRY-6s right here. Oh, those are the station wires, my apologies. But what happened here was the installer didn't push that gel, that nut to the bottom of the gel filled connector. So this could pose an issue in the future. So do's and don'ts of that. Please, please don't use a wire, a gel fill wire connector and then put it inside of that connect, that gel filled tube. It's not going to work. It's not going to fit. And this is not a good connection. Even though you think you're doubling down, it ain't going to work. Uh, make sure you get those connectors all the way to the bottom. All right. So let's talk about assigning the decoders. So when we're assigning the decoders, it's easy on the easy decoder system. You put the two wires in, turn the station on from the face pack that you want to program, and simply press the program button. That will flash the indicator light on the decoder and the program module, and you've done it successfully. If you're programming a master valve, do not turn anything on with the controller in the off position or in the just run position. Put the two wire leads in and press the program button. Now you've just programmed a uh, pump master valve. Super easy. You can do that also with the handheld programmer, the handheld diagnostic tool slash programmer. Using the little uh, openings inside, you open that up. It'll actually show you a red and a blue connector to line it up. Doesn't really matter which one they go in, but you can program it there as well. Now from the ACC side, you have the programming ports in the controller, but you also have the um, ICDHP handheld programming device. This one is a great diagnostic tool. You can program the decoders using the wireless induction and you can do the diagnostics wirelessly as well. So we have a, a, a tool for each controller just to keep you on, on point there. All right, so for sensors, I wanna talk about the sensors that are capable for these controllers. Flow, rain, ET, wind, and soil. So flow sensing, HC flow, and the HFS are the ones that we sell. But our ACC2 um, and ACCs, they are compatible with pretty much any flow sensor. And with Centralis connection to the ICC2, 
you can pretty much install any flow sensor as well. Uh, the HC flow is typically for HydroWise. So if you're installing a HydroWise controller with flow, you're going to select that one. Now, you can do, like I said, from the sensor decoder, you can do the flow sensor. And from the controller specifically wired in, you can also do flow. Um, we have wireless options for each, the for both the HC flow and the Hunter flow sensor. Here's our rain sensing opportunities here, the rain click and mini click. Both have wired and wireless options. The ET sensing solar sync, that can be wired directly into the controller. Soil click, this is soil moisture sensing. If your system is gonna run, it won't allow it to if the soil is super wet. You set the threshold, and then once it hits that threshold, it says, do not water. Once it goes below that threshold, it'll activate. So we've got a team of experts in the field that are here for you guys. If you have any questions on designing, installing, troubleshooting, please feel free to reach out to us anytime. We're out and about all the time, and we really want to do training to help you guys get better at two wire. So with those other documents that I sent you, hopefully you have some tools to take away from the meeting today that will help you out in designing, installing, and troubleshooting. And that's all I got for you. So I wanted to see if there were any questions. Greg, I, uh, I took we... up all the time, Robert. I'm sorry. That no. was like right at the 16 minutes. Not a problem. I think we have time for maybe one question. So I'll go with the first that we received. So our friend Paul Barker, if the shielded wire is run through a multi Complex or stations may be added on in the future. What is the best practice for splicing into that cable where slack might not exist in the ground? If you didn't have slack and you absolutely needed to make a connection there, what you could do is you could dig back the connection. So where the wire comes in, if you can see my, my fingers here, you don't have any extra tension there. So what you can do is you can dig back on either side, cut the wire in the middle, create some extra slack and then run a new daisy chain wire between those two connections. But if you do that, make sure that you put the splice that you're making on the two wire path in a valve box. So you can find it in the future. Do not just bury it right into the dirt. Uh, but that is one way to create extra slack. If there is a damage in the wire, or if you needed to add a T splice somewhere that wasn't anticipated prior. Now, any valve box should have a little extra slack. So if you go to your nearest valve box, you can just tee into the wire there. Makes it easy to find that T connection later too, because it's already in a valve box for you. Excellent. Thank you for that, Greg. Everyone, it looks like we're out of time. I will make sure that all of these extra questions reach not only Greg, but our uh, professional development team here at the IA. We'll do our best to get those answered for you uh, soon. Uh, thank you for attending, and please don't forget to check our website for upcoming webinars throughout the year. A big thanks to Greg for sharing his knowledge with us today, and to Hunter Industries for sponsoring the webinar. Like I said, if you have some questions that we didn't answer, please feel free to email them to education at irrigation.org, and we'll pass them on to the appropriate team member. That concludes our webinar. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you, Robert. Have a great day, everyone.